So Katie, you know, why don't you just take just a minute or two to tell us your take on biomimicry and how you got there? Yeah, I mean, so many people haven't heard of it. I was oblivious to it until about six years ago when I had an interaction with a slug that actually introduced me to biomimicry. But in a nutshell, it's looking, it's consciously looking at nature's genius for solutions and strategies to solve problems and create solutions. That's it, right? It's like, yeah. instead of all of us just sweating and trying to come up with something out of the blue to solve human problems or problems in the world, uh, you know, it's it's likely that Mother Nature already solved that thing a billion years ago. A hundred percent. And it's just this idea that why are we locking ourselves into one species, humans, we have just 200,000 years on this planet, and how will that ever compete with 30 million species across 3.8 billion years of research and development and tinkering with their inherited traits? And um, they've come up with solutions that we could never come up with ourselves. So let's tap into that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, we can shift right into the reality here is that people like NASA, M MIT, Bill Gates, they are looking to nature for answers. The people who have the resources and the real access to the best science in the world, even they are turning to biomimicry and folks who are, have expertise in this for answers to the big problems that they, that they really care about. So catch us up on all that interest and, and why should we care and all that? Yeah, you could say that we're in the most defining decade of human history, right? There's so much at stake. So what does it mean when the most powerful and resourced and brilliant amongst us turn to the feathered and the finned and the furred for answers on the next big breakthrough? And that's really what I love about biomimicry. It's, it's not what you'd expect. They're not just turning to the obvious legends like the sharks and the elephants and the cheetahs and the whales. They're turning to the overlooked creatures, the stuff that we don't even take that seriously. We'll turn to termites for answers on self-cooling buildings, slug slime for surgical superglue. NASA's consulting with slime mold, a brainless one-celled organism <laughs> with the amount of neurons as a paper towel um, for mapping the dark cosmos. It's completely, it's fascinating. So yeah, there's so much I don't know to be true in the world, but I really believe that right now um, we need innovations that surpass, they upend the status quo and the true masters of technology and innovation are everywhere. They're humble and they have the nature's lab in common. And that's really mm -hmm. what this is all about. So, um, yeah, this, that yeah. is so beautifully said. Thank you for saying it just like that. I, if you see me going like this, you gave me goosebumps when you gave those three quick examples. That's what I want people to understand. You know, we can look at slug slime for an answer to, you know, surgically closing wounds without stitches. I mean, there are billions of answers just waiting for us in nature like that. Yeah. And I think that we've kind of always pedestaled human beings and we've always kind of thought of ourselves, so many of us, obviously everyone, but so many of us have kind of um, pedestaled. We think that we're smarter, um, more intelligent. We have emotions that other animals and creatures don't have, but that's just not the case. And um, they also have just a skill set and strategies that we would never, you know, be able to get to without them. So I don't know, it really lights me up just thinking about kind of reframing the world and the the wild world in that way. Um, they're allies. Yeah. I like to give people um, some examples of what inspired me about biomimicry. And the quick ones I can think of off the top of my head was when I learned that the bullet train, the end of the bullet train the nose of the bullet train was designed to cut through the air faster and lighten the drag on the train and so forth. Well, they used the beak of a kingfisher. The way the kingfisher dives and enters the water, that has so little drag on it that they they actually designed the, the front of the bullet train from that. Um, another one that I came across that I like to use as examples of what's possible is um, the fact that I, I, I think I've heard somewhere where we could be making the doorknobs in hospitals where yes. infection control is so important. We could be making that on a nanoparticle level like the skin of a shark because shark skin does not hold bacteria very well. Yes. I mean, those are my two big examples. I love those examples. What about you? What are your two favorite examples? Yeah, I'm going to riff off of two of your examples. Um, okay. One, the shark skin uh, example is fantastic. And it was so good that they, you mentioned the spaceship. They actually brought that shark skin inspired adhesive to outer space because it was so good. So that like in a place where you're like, you need to be so thoughtful about every little thing that you have in there. They brought this material. So that's a huge endorsement for that shark skin adhesive. And then the 
I just learned this and I think the bullet train is such a cool example, of course. Um, but it's also modeled after two other birds. Um, one being the owl. That's because they're having sound issues too. And owls are silent flyers. Like you can hear there's certain birds like a hawk who actually may make noise to stun its prey. An owl wants to fly completely silently. And so they created these small serrations in the wing and applied that to the sides of the bullet train to make it quieter. And then they shaped the belly to be more like an Adeli penguin to lower wind resistance and make it more efficient. So those are two, I, I feel like those are two kind of lesser known parts to that example, but it's such a good one. 